Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll make a start on this uh, rather autumnal English day with uh, the usual transport chaos and mayhem in London, I, I believe. Uh, my name is Douglas Barry. I'm Senior Fellow for Military Aerospace at the Institute. I'm delighted to be joined today by Bridge Colby, who's the Robert M. Gates Fellow at the Centre for a New American Security. Uh, previously, he was at the CNA, which is or set start, started out as the, uh, the naval equivalent to RAND, and before then, he was the, at the U.S. government, uh, and he was involved in um, the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, amongst other things. Uh, he's specialist in uh, strategic defence issues, um, nuclear weapons, deterrence, um, intelligence, and related items, as it were. He's going to talk to us this morning about U.S. arms control policy and strategic posture in the face of resurgent Russia. Bridge will talk for about 30 minutes, and we'll then open it up to Q&A. Bridge, it's all yours. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to Douglas and to the uh, uh, International Institute of Strategic Studies for having me. It's a, an honor and a, a privilege to, to, to speak here and to speak to such a, a distinguished group. Thank you all for braving this uh, this fall fall day. I guess I'm in London, so rain is not so intimidating as it is in, in uh, on the East Coast of the United States. But uh, And it's great to see also a number of, of, of friends and, and colleagues in the audience. But what I thought I'd talk about, uh, uh, you know, talking with Douglas and, and Mark, um, was the kind of the changing uh, uh, U.S. view or the challenges to the existing U.S. view uh, of our strategic posture and our arms control posture in particular in light of a resurgent Russia. And of course, I need hardly belabor the point about uh, the, resurgent, uh, the resurgent Russia. But what, what, do I, what do I mean by this? Um, I think we're all familiar, you know, being in this temple of, of traditional deterrence, thinking uh, of what the sort of Cold War idea was uh, of deterrence. We can go back to the, the classic uh, texts and, and, and pacts and so forth and strategic documents. But I think the post-Cold War uh, U.S. and to some extent Western strategic and arms control posture, uh, which I think is, is, is increasingly outdated uh, by Russia's uh, recent assertive, assertiveness in military developments, uh, dated to and derived from the warming uh, of relations with Moscow and the sense of a, of a markedly, obviously, decreasing threat to Europe and NATO from, from the Russian, or then uh, what became the Russian Federation. And in light of this, uh, the idea, the sort of the, the, what became this, this post-Cold War strategic posture was a movement in the direction of uh, reducing the salience uh, or the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. Uh, defense and broader uh, political strategy, both in Europe and, and, and beyond, but at the same time hedging. Uh, you know, you, if you look at the, at the nuclear policy documents, the nuclear posture reviews, the three of them, each of them in some way, the, the 2002 version is a little different, but more or less have this idea of a basic strategic hedge, a basic retaliatory capability, um, but a, a desire to hedge in case Russia uh, uh, you know, turned turned in a different direction, or if China sprinted to parity or something like that. But that, in, in effect, uh, implicitly, I think it was moving in the direction of a relegation of U.S. nuclear forces to the margins, and the aspiration towards um, more or less uh, primary, if not, if not eventually, full reliance on, on conventional forces for deterrence uh, and defense. And this is, of course, for a number of reasons, both because of the sort of abhorrence of, of nuclear weapons and the lack of necessity as well as the ability to use conventional forces in a more discretionary way, which was something that appealed to uh, people in, in the West for a number of different reasons, some of them humanitarian, some of them more strategic, uh, but I think appealed across the, the, the political and strategic spectrum. And then arms control also changed. Obviously, arms control in the Cold War was, was an instrument of stability, of a reduction of the sense of threat, of, of uh, you know, the very imposing threat posed by, by the Soviet Union. Um, but in the wake of the, of the diminution of the sense of threat from, the, from Russia, from Moscow, arms control became, I think, more of a mechanism or a facilitator for political rapprochement. You had INF and START I, uh, which were themselves sort of in content legacies of the Cold War, informed by the Cold War structure. But in practice, I think particularly at the higher political level, these were seen more as these instruments of, of, warming, of warming ties. And I think this is something that characterized actually both sides of the American political spectrum. In the Clinton administration, you had START II and START III, but the Bush administration had uh, uh, the Moscow Treaty, which was, which was uh, uh, you know, basically seen as, you know, we'll make our nuclear uh, postures as they are, and then let's, let's you know, sign on the dotted line in, in, the, in the, 
in the in a, in a gesture towards uh, political conciliation. And of course, New Start, which I worked on, I thought was very much um, not to speak out of school, but I thought was something that was also, particularly at the higher political level, was seen more as an instrument of, of political uh, uh, rapprochement and conciliation as part of the reset, of course, even though its content was still this legacy sort of Cold War structure. But I think that the basic perception was that the threat from Russia and of their strategic capabilities was so minimal or so marginal in these years that arms control uh, should be used more for these kind of political purposes, these more practical purposes, because these traditional strategic ones were seen as relatively uh, uh, you know, unrealistic. Um, but I think, you know, as is clear, all of this sort of both the strategic posture and the arms control posture were predicated on the idea that, that Russia was not particularly menacing. Um, you know, Russia seemed to have neither the will nor the capabilities to menace genuine or very real uh, or felt U.S. And, and NATO or Western interests. So having a strategic uh, posture that was largely characterized by inertia uh, and an arms control posture that was uh, focused, in, in effect, I think, more on symbolism and totems uh, than on a genuine strategic agenda was a defensible position, and in some sense it was the ascendant position. But I think in light of the, what's happened in the last six, six to eight months, this is no longer so clearly the case. This is no longer such a compelling uh, uh, sort of uh, persuasive agenda. Um, cr Russia clearly, I think I need hardly uh, say to this audience, has the will to push against Western and NATO interests, certainly in its near abroad, um, and potentially beyond that, although certainly less less clearly. Um, you know, I do. I certainly do not want to paint uh, Russia as sort of some uh, unbridled monster. Uh, I think there's a spirited debate. Uh, some of the some of the, the the fellows here at Double I Double S, like Sam Cherif, are part of this debate about what is actually motivating Moscow, uh, and how much recognition or legitimacy should be accorded these these motivation and interests. But, you know, regardless of how legitimate and how we should approach it politically, the fact remains that Moscow is prepared to use force or the threat of force uh, in the European uh, uh, sort of theater or neighborhood in ways that, that we in the West uh, don't like and I think have reason to think could, could, be, could be considerably uh, uh, threatening. So I think this means that the plank of, of the U.S. Uh, and to some extent the Western legacy strategic posture that political tensions with Russia were modest at, uh, at most no longer holds. Uh, but nor, however, does I think the assumption that Russia does not have a meaningful capabilities to, to menace Western interests. Rather, Russia now incre increasingly evidently has a mixture of sort of lower order little green men, hybrid warfare kind of forces, as well as sort of an improved classic conventional capabilities. Um, as well as strategic non-nuclear and, of course, uh, nuclear capabilities that give it a rather formidable range of options to pursue its strategic interests, particularly in areas where it might enjoy an advantage in the balance of resolve, where its political uh, interests or aspirations are more intensively felt, uh, intensely felt than they are by, by say, the, the more powerful countries of the West. Um, now, of course, most attention so far has gone towards these little green men that, that we've heard about in, in Crimea and, and now Ukraine. But, you know, this is a significant challenge, but I think the more serious challenge, should it become realized or should it, the threat of it uh, be used for strategic effect, uh, that Russia would pose to, to NATO and to the West is the Russian capability to use force at higher levels of intensity or effectiveness in ways that could put NATO and, and the U.S. in a position in which escalation or counter-escalation is too unpalatable, risky, or costly. Um, and that's to say basically that Russia could, uh, could either threaten or ultimately use force in ways that in the local context would be effective or, or uh, availing and in ways that it would, it would be difficult or problematic or challenging for us in the West uh, to counter-escalate in ways that, that, we would find, that we would find palatable. Now, Russia is, is doing this, is, is fielding this set of capabilities by uh, building a sort of a menu of, of options and, and assets. Now, obviously, together, these are, are not the group of Soviet forces Germany or the, or the old Red Army by any stretch, but they do present a significant potential challenge to a NATO that has not invested heavily in its own local or theater uh, defense or really uh, at the higher levels as, as well. Obviously, you have Trident being being uh, extended here and so forth, and the French have also been active, but on the whole, obviously Western uh, defense investment has declined in general, uh, and, uh, and particularly has declined in these, in these sort of more higher, higher order uh, conventional uh, 
uh, and, and nuclear uh, echelons. Now, if you look at Russian conventional forces, Douglas and I were speaking a little bit about this uh, beforehand, it's an uneven picture. Um, it is certainly not the mass tank armies of the Soviet Union, but on the other hand, Putin could mobilize 100,000 men, or roughly, uh, across the border from, from Ukraine on relatively short notice, and these forces you know, were presumably uh, uh, at least quite uh, threatening and probably uh, enough to do a job in the relatively immediate sense. Um, and these are, these are significant forces, and of course the Russians have also been um, uh, uh, modernizing uh, you know, their, their ground forces, but also their surface-to-air missile systems, their air systems, uh, uh, and, and so forth. They give them a lot, of, a lot of capability as well as a lot of flexibility in how it can be employed. Um, such forces uh, would allow for Moscow uh, to pursue effective conventional force employment, in particular against vulnerable or weaker states in their near abroad, in the for particularly in the former Soviet Union. Of course, Georgia would be an example, or we could uh, see other some of the frozen conflicts. Um, but also, let's be honest, the NATO Baltics, uh, which do not themselves, of course, boast particularly formidable defensive capabilities, and where there is not a very significant local NATO uh, conventional or other or other defensive presence. Uh, this would allow uh, Moscow potentially to create fait accompli's or uh, changed uh, situations. Uh, that that uh, you know from which they could uh, then you know bargain either strategically or directly uh, uh, with the West in a, in, from a position of, of considerable strength and a sort of a new status quo. Um, you know, and on the other hand, other than Poland in particular, Eastern NATO does not have an impressive set of defensive capabilities. So, in the event of Russia pers uh, implementing such an approach. Uh, effective counteraction would require intervention, uh, presumably by the United States, and and probably and certainly for political purposes, but also in terms of capabilities, Western NATO, for instance, the UK and, and France. But but the problem is is that is that the conventional modernization, the ongoing conventional modernization. I'm talking not only about what's happening right now, but also what where the tra where the trajectory is heading. Um, is that such a counter intervention would not actually be easy, and I, you know, there are many in the audience who are far greater experts on these on these matters than I, including my my, my kind host. Um, but you know, my distinct impression, uh, which I think is not without foundation, is that such counter counteraction would not be easy. The Russian, for instance, let's just talk about Russian surface to air missile systems. We were just talking about the S three hundred system. You know, this is a very significant uh, uh, air defense problem, uh, even for the highest echelons of Western and U.S. and U.S. air power, and of course the S-300 is only one in a sequence of, of Russian um, modernizing air defense uh, defense systems. Um, so the fact is that the, the, the local context reaction to such a, the creation of a new situation could actually be, be quite hard, militarily speaking, but also the political or strategic dynamic could be quite challenging as, as well. Uh, because the escalatory burden in this context could very easily uh, be seen to fall upon NATO and the West shoulders, um, and this would this 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 uh, situation could be intensified um, by the fact that by the creation, for instance, of more powerful defensive redoubts or defensive positions that would require the West and NATO to act in ways that appeared more escalatory or uh, would widen or intensify the conflict. Um, you can see something similar in the Pacific where, where Chinese efforts, um, and I think Aaron Friedberg talked a lot about this in his recent IISS monograph, which I commend to all of you, but you know, the point that, that as countries can develop uh, more sophisticated defensive systems, that requires a more intense, uh, uh, more, more uh, uh, hard-edged, uh, quicker, uh, less controlled uh, uh, assault in order to, to bring down, and for instance, in order to perform, suppression of enemy air defenses, which is a core part of, of course, Western uh, air doctrine. Um, this, this is compounded by the fact that, that if you look at, particularly in the Baltics, um, so considerable elements of any Russian forces in such a contingency could actually be on Russian soil, not just in, in, in Russia uh, directly to the east, but also in Kaliningrad, which of course is another sort of logical escalatory you know, boundary or, or a, a firebreak is of course um, uh, avoiding attacks on the home territory of a, of a combatant. This could, be, this could actually make uh, effective action on the West part quite, quite difficult. And of course, furthermore, the Russians are in developing increasing uh, counter-escalatory options of their own. Uh, one of these uh, at the next sort of uh, level of, in of intensity or the next major step in escalation would be non-nuclear strategic strike capabilities. The Russians have talked quite a bit about conventional prompt global strike, although 
you know, whether it needs to be global or prompt is a different story, but there are ways in which the Russians could use uh, conventional strike, uh, for instance, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, per cyber attacks, so that it would not need to be kinetic. Um, and it's clear that the Russians have been, have been thinking quite a bit about this, and also that they've been exercising and deploying the platforms that could be used in such a function uh, increasingly. I mean, it's, it's received a decent amount of, of attention in the American press that Russian bombers are now operating uh, farther forward and with greater frequency, and of course other, other platforms uh, potentially uh, uh, as well. Um, and if such non-nuclear strike capabilities in the event uh, of, a, of a crisis or, or a conflict, even a limited conflict, could be used in a variety of roles. They could be used for purely military purposes beyond the immediate scope of conflict, but in ways that would make the, the West's campaign quite difficult or you know, could frustrate that campaign, for instance, attacks on command and control, theater command and control or particularly important uh, bases or ships, for instance. Uh, but they could also be used as a political signal, uh, which could have quite a significant effect on Western governments and publics. You know, the, it is possible that you could see non-nuclear strikes against against uh, you know sort of population targets, not not in a uh, not necessarily in a, in a way designed to cause casualties, but in a way to to signal uh, the possibility for escalation and the willingness of uh, the, the Russians to to walk down that that dangerous path. But of course, finally, the Russians also do have nuclear options. Uh, of course, we know about their extensive tactical nuclear uh, inventory, which they've they've demonstrated total uninterest or lack of interest in, in, in reducing or even really giving much transparency on. And we know they've also talked a lot about uh, controlled or limited nuclear use. They sometimes talk about escalate to de-escalate, uh, which is in some sense a, um, a concept that's familiar from, from Western thinking in the Cold War, uh, sort of controlled strategic war, uh, if, you, if you will. And I think we could, it's fair to say that these kinds of things might, be, might have been exercised. I, I, you know, I, I couldn't rattle it off. Uh, on my head, but we, we do know that the Russians in, in public for we do know that the Russians uh, exercise for nuclear use. Um, and of course, these could be used in a similar way, a more intensified way, a more dramatic way of kind of shaking the lapels or delivering a very sobering message to Western, Western audiences. Um, and, you know, the Russians have, again, made it clear in their white papers that they have been considering this. It's unclear what the scope of their declared willingness to use nuclear weapons is. Uh, it seemed to, in the 2010 paper, it seemed to have become narrower than the 2003 version, and there's some dispute about why that is. Personally, I'm inclined not to read too much or not to rely too much on, on white papers as a prediction of, of, how, of how Russia would behave for a variety of reasons, but, but people have, have disagreements about that. Um, you know, and, and basically, I think it's important to emphasize that, that this, this potential use um, uh, can be effective without it ever even, without certainly being used and without it ever becoming very explicit even, the threat of it becoming very explicit. I and mean, one of the things I think we all, we all have heard is, well, you know, nuclear weapons aren't relevant to this, uh, to this situation with the little green men. What are you talking about? Which, you know, I'm biased. I, I work on these things. But, you know, so discount what I'm going to say. But I think it's a valid point, which is um, everybody knows that when we're thinking about the potential for escalation with, with Russia, we are thinking about the nuclear shadow. And it seems to me that the Russians are quite conscious of their uh, ability or their desire to manipulate the nuclear shadow for strategic, for strategic gain. I think we need to be conscious of this, uh, not fall prey one to an extreme on one way or the other, which is to say either that they're re irrelevant or that we're sort of frozen uh, in fear by the possibility of use. But we need to, we need to grapple uh, with, with the reality of this of this possible, uh, of this of this possible use. I mean, nuclear weapons fundamentally don't need to actually be employed to be efficacious. Uh, I mean, the the security of Western Europe in the Cold War is, is the ultimate example of that. Now, I don't I don't want to exaggerate what I'm talking about. The Russians uh, still do have very significant um, burdens, and probably over time, given their demographics and an uneven economy, they are they are looking at a uh, a problematic situation militarily as well as in, as in other uh, you know sectors of society. But I do think the fact remains in, uh, that we, we do face a significant challenge to, to Western security uh, in, some, in some degree uh, uh, and that, that could intensify. And I think at the very least, this new reality presents a probably crippling challenge to this legacy U.S. strategic and arms control posture that I, um, that I mentioned earlier. And I think, you know, for instance, if you look at General Breedlove's comments, they, they, they uh, support this. NATO is ill-equipped. I think there was a UK parliamentary committee that found 
Similarly, the, the, the NATO uh, uh, conventional defense, particularly in the East, was, was weaker than it would, would need to be in a lot of these scenarios. Um, but also the U.S. nuclear weapons posture, and I think probably the British one as well, the French may be a little more complicated, but are, is not optimized for this kind of uh, uh, a strategic uh, uh, dynamic, for this kind of escalatory uh, uh, sort of contest or, uh, on the escalatory ladder or competition. And I think that ultimately you, the U.S. and NATO should want capabilities that show Russia that attempts to use their nuclear weapons or their non-strategic conventional forces or, or otherwise uh, in, these kind of, in this kind of limited fashion for strategic gain would, would not be availing and would be, would be risky and, and likely very costly um, for them. But we're, we're quite far from this because uh, in addition, I think I should mention the, the U.S. legacy arms control posture has also been called into question and not simply by this this general political reality, Ukraine and Crimea, uh, and so forth, but in particular by uh, Russia's uh, appear, uh, apparently quite evident uh, and quite clear violation of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, the details remain unclear to me, at least. Uh, some of you may know more, but the U.S. government uh, does seem very confident uh, in the fact that, or in, in its assessment, that Russia has violated uh, this treaty. I think the most clear evidence is in the Arms Control and Compliance Report, which the, the executive branch has to submit to Congress, which specifically said it was a violation. And, and you know, given the Obama administration's view of arms control, I think this was a very serious uh, concession uh, or, or you know, statement. Um, and I think my anecdotally, my, my discussions with, with people who are more informed on this than I uh, indicate that, that there is a, a high degree of, of uh, conviction that, that, that there has been an outright violation. Um, and this, you know, I think quite, quite flagrant violation undermines the core tenet of arms control's effective logic in the post-Cold War era, uh, that it would foster trust through demonstrated good behavior on both parts, that it would facilitate uh, the warming of relations and, and the era of good feelings, if you will. Um, instead, what we see is not just a withdrawal uh, from the treaty, as you had with the U.S. withdrawing from the ABM Treaty in 2002, um, you know, about which people can disagree, but apparently a deliberate violation while staying in. But in, you know, in the wake of such a step, how can, uh, how can trust recover from such a blow in the arms control context? I think it really, it really uh, insistently uh, asks that question. Um, and I think this kind of leaves arms control with Russia in a sort of no man's land because on the one hand, trust has been lost and re re really can't expect it to recover anytime soon. But on the other, people are simply, <laughs> they're not scared enough uh, for arms control to be useful or, or important as in the kind of SALT 1 and SALT 2 model, uh, which is a, of course a, a good thing and justified, but, but a reality. So you know, together this indicates to my eye that the US legacy strategic posture, uh, one that focused primarily on more or less a simple extension of basic U.S. nuclear capabilities, reduced nuclear capabilities focused on retaliation and strategic use as they exist at the end of the Cold War, and an arms control policy oriented towards building trust and fostering good relations is no longer apposite. Rather, we in the U.S. and in NATO more broadly need to grapple with the implications of a disgruntled Russia uh, willing to use force on points that we care about and possibly really care about, and possessed of capabilities to do so in a quite effective and for us, I think, problematic and challenging variety of ways. Now, I'd like to reiterate again that I'm, I'm not calling for an unbridled strategic competition with Russia. I by no means think the diagnosis supports this. And I do hope that we can find a tolerable equilibrium with Moscow uh, about the regional order that is, on the one hand, respectful of Moscow's interests, but in ways that don't abridge the legitimate and important rights of the countries in the region, NATO and non-NATO, but of course, particularly NATO. Um, but in the spirit, I think, if good fences make good neighbors, I think we need to adapt our deterrent and defense posture, as well as our arms control policy, to this new Russian reality. I think we should show Moscow that attempts to exploit its points of leverage, or points of leverage that it, it thinks it might have, on issues that we do care about would be, again, as I said, unwise, counterproductive, uh, and dangerous. Now, I'm actually personally interested in exploring in greater depth what, uh, what this might entail in, in, in detail. Um, but conceptually, I think at the military and defense level, it means having defense capabilities and I, all the way to the strategic and the nuclear levels that give NATO <coughs> credible, effective, discriminant, and also potent uh, capabilities to respond to possible Russian provocations or worse. Um, I think this means basically having options to respond to potential Russian provocations or, or serial or limited aggression 
in a way that is that is plausible for us, that, that appears to be controlling and, and uh, paying deference to the realities of escalation management, but that are also not, not feckless. Now, of course, this means, I think, at the lower end, response to little green, little green men, you know, effective policing, you know, reform if necessary in some of the, the former Soviet Union countries. Uh, but I think it also means non-nuclear and nuclear capabilities that could be employed to frustrate Russian attempts to exploit the strategic effect of or use their own higher echelon capabilities, which, again, are, are quite real. And I'm happy to talk in, in greater detail about that if of interest. But at the same time, however, I think that arms control still does have an important place in relations with Russia. In fact, perhaps more of an important role uh, than, uh, than during the post-Cold War years. I, I, for one, was never really convinced that arms control was a very effective uh, method or mechanism for improving relations on its own. It's obviously sort of, it's like a you know, legal contract, it's haggling. Um, but I think that, uh, that, that arms control can play, can continue to play an important role, and that is to promote stability. In some sense, to go back to some of the thinking, uh, uh, the logic that characterized arms control uh, in, in the past, I think in general terms that means that both sides should, should sense or perceive that their retaliatory capability is secure, and therefore that, that nuclear use on their part would only be uh, deliberate uh, and would not be the product of miscalculation or accidents uh, or, uh, or a misperception of something that, that, that's happening. And I think, but I do think this means a relatively significant change in the scope of, of where arms control at least is, is today or has been for the last few years in, in a focus on enabling demonstrations that again, neither side has the will or the capability to remove this basic retaliatory capability. Which for instance, we know that the Russians actually are concerned about. The Russians have, you know, I think, you know, partially for political gain, but also genuinely fear that in particular that the Americans have the ability uh, or could have the ability uh, to to si significantly degrade or even deny their their retaliatory capability, uh, not just missile defense, but also conventional strike and, and so forth. Um, so you know, in in light of that, a couple of things that might work would be, for instance, the Russians have expressed concern about the ability of the United States to use conventional strike, for instance, conventional cruise missiles, uh, as part of a disarming first strike, in, including one that might not even involve nuclear weapons against. Russian strategic forces. Well, one you know, one thing you could do would be to test the effectiveness of conventional cruise missiles against against hardened silos. You could have the, the two national academies of science do it, or the national labs, or others. I was just talking to Paul Schulte about this. Apparently, this has been floated, and the Russians have rejected it. But you know, uh, part of the thing about arms control is it better it's better to have a good idea that, that the other guy rejects. It certainly makes you look more more reasonable. Similarly, with, with BMD interceptors, for instance, if they're launched from Alaska, the, the trajectory could be legitimately quite disturbing for the Russians. It's also something where you could explore potential for confidence building, uh, of course, you know, commensurate with, with security as ever, but to try to give the Russians a reasonable degree of assurance that these are not intended uh, uh, as offensive strike uh, uh, weapons. Um, you know, obviously there's not going to be very much in the near term. I think the, the levels of trust and, and the political uh, uh, re you know, relationship and context is, is, is not good. Um, but I think these could, over the medium and longer term, especially as relations are unlikely to be particular, you know, warm up significantly, I think. Uh, but the military dimension is going to be uh, real and in some senses more real than it has been in the past. These kind of arms control steps could be could be quite, quite, quite useful. So, um, you know, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I mean, I'd just say I think this, um, the, the, my presentation may not be in the sort of the, the vein of most of what people have talked about in the NATO context in the last 25 or 30 years, but I would say that I think, uh, you know, strategy and history, unfortunately, to some extent, have, have returned in Europe, and so we need to grapple with, with these harder strategic <laughs> questions, and I think I offer these in the spirit of, you know, again, good fences make uh, uh, good neighbors. I think NATO and the West will be better off and more able to, to negotiate with the Russians from a position of, of strength, uh, uh, which is undoubtedly the better position to negotiate from. Uh, if, they, if, if we think through these kinds of things and, and pursue reforms that, that, that flow from them. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce, for that uh, <coughs> very uh, thought-provoking um, address. Um, question and answer session now. Uh, when you ask your first question, if you just identify who you are. Uh, Mark, I saw you first. <laughs> Sorry, thanks very much, Bruce. Mark Fitzpatrick, SSS. Uh, I'm not up there because I thought I would be here. <laughs> Well, I'm delighted you are. Certainly. Um, well, anyway, this is this is more in the uh, uh, 
in, uh, in the realm of, uh, of, of Douglas's uh, <coughs> mm -hmm. department and mine. Uh, here's the, here's uh, I have two questions, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, Rich, much of uh, you, you focused uh, your talk about based on changes of the last uh, six to eight months. But much of what you have been advocating in terms of uh, negotiating with Russia from a position of strength is what many people in Washington of a certain political mm -hmm. persuasion have been saying for years and years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this just validates their what they've already been saying. And on the other side, uh, the people who advocate uh, withdrawing tactical nuclear weapons from Europe still say that. Mm -hmm. uh, so are there changes in the margins of these positions? And for example, the US uh, uh, nuclear um, uh, uh, posture. Uh, what, what, no, what, what was it? Last year? Uh, was it last year or two years ago? The, panic, uh, the, the uh, Some analysis said the United States could reduce the strategic forces by one third without any uh, impediment to um, uh, deterrence. Do you think that uh, that kind of thinking has, has changed within the Obama administration? And then the related point is uh, budget problems. Uh, the United States sequestering and the kind of um, reductions that are going to be necessary in the future, particularly when you have so much need for recapitalization of strategic forces. Uh, how are we going to do what you're suggesting given the budget? Mm -hmm. Well, no, the, uh, excellent questions, Mark. Th thank you very much. Um, on your on your first question, I think it's a very a very a very good one and a fair one, which is if I if I re reinterpret it is is basically. Um, is this just, you know, in Washington at large, is this just an, an, an opportunity for various parts of the spectrum to kind of reiterate their, their existing existing positions? I mean, I, I talked mostly about the kind of the capabilities and the strategic element. My, my particular view, um, you know, and I'm sort of a, I guess I would kind of call myself a realist small r, you know, but is, is that um, I think we've actually... It appears to me we've ignored the defense aspects of our, our of NATO posture, even as we've expanded it, and our political goals have been quite uh, expansive, have been quite aggressive. Aggressive is not the right word. Have been quite um, uh, aspirational, quite high. And I, it seems to me that we're in a position right now, looking at it again, not as a Russia expert, but where we are insisting on a on a on a very high political set of goals, but from a position of relatively weak uh, defensive capabilities, especially in the areas, I mean, we're not talking about the Russians coming into Germany, obviously, thank God. We're talking about situ contingencies p that are possible in the former Soviet Union in particular, both NATO and non-NATO, and, and in the New York Times, at least today, there was a big article about the Estonian intelligence officer who apparently has been kidnapped by the Russians. So so this is something that is, you know, not fantastical. I mean, I think everybody would, sit, would, would, would recognize it as not fantastical. So you know, I, I, in some way, I think I, I find myself a little orthogonal, which you know, maybe is a little cute because, oh, of course, I'm different. But, but I think it, you know, genuinely, in a sense, you know, that 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 the 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 the, 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 the sort of regnant, uh, more left position or dovish position has been, you know, it's a result of misunderstanding. We want to we want to reduce the salience of, of all kinds of military capabilities and, and <coughs> military dimensions in the relationship. Um, you know, in the interest of a, just sort of a warming of relations, if, if I could simplify. And, but on the right, the sort of hawkish end, it's been a kind of, you know, we want to be as strong as possible, uh, but also be as politically uh, assertive and po politically aspirational as possible. I mean, my, my view is that we should, on the military capability, be as strong as, as we possibly can, but we should perhaps be more, be some some degree more measured in our political um, than we may have at, at, at times been in the last the last 25 years, and that's not to give any aid and comfort to Putin by any stretch. But um, I am of sort of the, you know, in instinct that this is a, going to be a lasting, or, or it's it's likely to be a lasting political sort of uh, uh, complexion in Russia, and they have capabilities. So this needs to be this needs to be dealt with. So I guess I guess the way that I would say that that my my way is a little bit different is that say. Um, we should be strong, but we should actually we should actually pursue genuine uh, engagement, even as even as we decry and condemn what they're doing. Um, but you know, for instance, you know, some people just don't like arms control at all. They would rather have us be in a position of strength, but not negotiate. Whereas my, my preference would be to be in a in a strong position, but then actually seek to find some kind of equilibrium, which uh, which you know, I mean, not to put myself in the same camp, but uh, you know, somebody like Kissinger's writings on this topic, I think, have have been in somewhat in this vein. So hopefully that makes some sense. On the budget issue, you know, I'm always 
I, you know, if you forgive me, I think the budget issue is a little exaggerated on the nuclear force because if you, you know, if you look over the even over the life cycle of the recapitalization, at most I think it will be five to seven percent of the defense budget, and that's in particular in the 2020s when the Reagan era systems are, are need to be recapitalized, particularly the Ohio ballistic missile system. Um, so there are there are financial challenges, but a lot of it is actually kind of dealing with how you space out the, the systems and how you make trades within the larger. Defense budget. I mean, one thing you could do is push the ICBM recapitalization out farther beyond 2030, when most of the submarines will come through. Um, you know, my, my more broadly, you know, looked at it, looking at it conceptually, my my view is that, you know, and there's a very interesting push that's beginning in the Pentagon that I that I you know I'd urge you all to look at, which, for instance, Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work gave a speech to the Council on Foreign Relations the other day. Uh, Under Secretary of Defense Frank Kendall gave a, has given a series of speeches. Uh, Secretary Hagel has all pointing to the challenges to U.S. military technological superiority that are that are coming not just from Russia but also China and even from some smaller players like Iran and North Korea. Um, and that's both nuclear weapons, but also uh, the proliferation of advanced conventional systems. I think that the United States should focus much more on maintaining its military technological superiority and should downshift. On or or, dis, or or lessen its investment in capabilities like stabilization operations, counterinsurgency, etc., um, uh, presence operations. Um, I just don't think we can afford it. And so I would look at things like the nuclear forces, but also strategic capabilities of all kinds: space, cyber, long-range strike, unmanned systems, etc. Now, that's just my view. I don't, I'm not saying that that's likely to happen. But that's that's I think the honest answer to your question about budget. I would I would cut. The forces that we might have used to occupy, a, you know, a chaotic Middle Eastern country, and put them more in in making the carrier relevant, you know, or making our space architecture more resilient, and hardened, and capable. I'll take <coughs> three questions from the front row. Who their hands up first? So, the gentleman here, and then you, and then uh, Nick Papadimitriou, amanuensis for Lady Kennet, who can't be here. Mm -hmm. um, where does the ABM uh, system in uh, Europe come into play here? I, I picked up on rumbl rumblings from the Kremlin uh, from about August last year. It was uh, really annoying them, even though <laughs> these missiles were there ostensibly to deal with Iran. Mm. And whether they were there to deal with Iran or not, are we now going to find that they're also useful in a new role as a, an anti-Russian um, technology? Thank you. Uh, my name is Sikrum Davislotter. I'm an Icelandic journalist. I have two questions. First of all, I mean, Russia has obviously shown aggression, and that has been met with trade sanctions. I was just wondering the role of trade sanctions within the environment that you were describing. And then also, how much hard nosed strategy is in what Putin is doing, according to you? When he says something like, oh, by the way, you know, we have, milita uh, we have nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. How much is this spontaneous, mm. and how much is it just up to him, basically? Mm. Paul Shaw from Birmingham and Kings. Um, first general uh, point is, isn't uh, you haven't you highlighted a contradiction in the way we we Western states even talk about these nuclear issues? Because you referred to the nuclear shadow, mm -hmm. the impact, the, the silent shaping impact of nuclear weapons before crisis. Uh, and yet, the position we're all committed to officially is that nuclear weapons have little utility, must be got rid of, their salience must be reduced. So the kind of considerations that you're talking about, the, 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 the generation of what I've heard called the kind of base pedal note of international relationships, those, those new silent throbbing of nuclear, <laughs> nuclear arsenals, um, how can they even be addressed in, in uh, open discussion or intra-alliance discussion. So, so there's a kind of conceptual con contradiction there, and I, I wonder how one gets over that. But second, more specific point on the INF violation. Um, I've heard two, <coughs> at least two explanations. One, this is about China. It's the simplest way of Russia being able to counter a Chinese threat that it can't openly talk about. The other is, well, it might be quite useful if you begin to station these things close to the NATO border so they can reach anywhere in Western Europe, and then you generate the kind of constraints that we were worried about in the original INF crisis. Which do you think is more likely? What indicators would 
apart from obvious geography, would, would show that. And when are we likely to know? Well, uh, great, great series of, of questions. Um, uh, first, uh, sorry, your, your question about the, the missile defense system. Um, well, it's an interesting question. It's a little frustrating because the, the United States has been insisting for, I think, since the beginning of the of the system under the Bush administration that these were for uh, uh, Iran. And I think, you know, my impression of, of these missile defense capabilities is that they are really designed to deal with the Iranian threat. They are not designed to deal uh, with, with the Russian threat. Of course, you know, the Russian fear is a combination of, you know, the actual defensive capabilities of the missiles, the possibility that, that, that those defensive capabilities could be improved over time from an installed architecture, as well as the sort of latent potential offensive strike capability of such, of such systems. I mean, now you've had, in the last few months, you've had Americans who are sort of very enthralled with the idea of a sort of unhindered or, or uh, you know, very optimistic vision of, of a kind of a total missile defense talking about orienting these systems towards towards Russia. I mean, the problem is, you know, I take the Pentagon and its word. I take, the, I think, I think it's true that these missile defense systems are not capable against Russian systems. I mean, one of the truisms of international politics seem to be that the Russians and the Chinese think a lot more highly of U.S. missile defense systems than American professionals do. And I, I don't consider myself a professional in this respect. I'm talking about real technical professionals. Now, maybe I'm being, maybe I'm being uh, uh, naive, but, but it's my distinct impression that they're not. So I actually think this is politically quite counterproductive. I don't think you want to be messing over the longer term with a system that I think we probably, you know, would like to have over a very long time and to deal with Middle East missile prol proliferation and, and WMB proliferation, uh, in which we don't have much of a realistic hope of dealing with uh, a Russian uh, missile attack of any, of, any, of any capability. Now, of course, any missile defense system has a latent capability and in the event of a conflict or a contingency, we would use missile defense systems as, as we, I'm sure, as we, as we could. But, um, you know, my, my preference would be, even though we've had, despite the, the significantly worsening relations with the Russians, my, my recommendation would be to very, be very consistent, in particular in this time of temptation, to say, no, 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 these missiles are for Iran, we're working on them for Iran, you know, and then, you know, if we wanted to talk about changing that, well, we could think that through, maybe other, other capabilities, but um, I think it, you know, once you leave that behind, it's going to be hard to walk it back, you know, if, relation, if we do wish to, you know, if we do wish to, to, to pursue a, a more constructive Russia, a relationship with Russia, or if we wish to minimize opposition from Russia, even in the, in the, in the event of uh, continued, continued uh, poor, poor relations. So hopefully that answers your, your question, but... Uh, um, uh, Ma'am, in terms of your questions about trade sanctions, I'm, I'm not really a, a, a trade specialist. I, I'm an interested amateur, but I think that um, you know clearly trade sanctions are can be useful um, up to a point. I, there was a very good article by Megan O'Sullivan uh, about I don't know I'd say six months ago, who's a real student of sanctions and influential U.S. policy voice, but sort of laying out how you make sanctions ineffective. And and I mean you know I think there are the sanctions that we currently have in place satisfy some of the criteria, but I don't think they're going to be a solution. Um, you know, there was an article in the New York Times about about there was some party in Moscow of all the people who'd been sanctioned, and, you know, I mean, clearly they're resolute, and these are people who are, you know, prepared to, to do some degree of, uh, go through some degree of, of pain, at least if they can share the pain. Um, so I would say that, that trade sanctions can only be a part and probably a subsidiary part of a broader strategy, especially if you're dealing with a country like Russia. I mean, we're not dealing with Iran, which is itself a large country. Um, but, uh, you know, and there's also the issue, which, again, I'm, I'm, I'm more wondering about this than I have a decided opinion, but um, I wonder about, you know, the diminishing returns, the diminishing value of sanctions. Um, you know, you, I'm sure you already see adaptation, I, I would imagine you would feel it here in London, uh, given the Russian presence, uh, about moving money, and, uh, you know, there was something with the, uh, in the press about the SWIFT, System when there was a rumor that that might be part of it, there was a huge amount of money that, that, that was moved through. So, you know, there's discussion about an alternative currency that seems to be exaggerated at this point. But we don't want to push things in this. Certainly, we Americans who, you know, profit from the <laughs> the, the privilege of the dollar. So I think we need to be conscious of that. But um, so I would say they play a, a relatively a partial role. Um, how strategic is Putin? I don't know. I'm not a real Putin watcher, but my guess would be that he doesn't say things without, you know some idea of what he's saying. Um, and I think something like this where he was, you know, my sense is that the Russians want the nuclear, um, want us to be thinking that they are thinking about the nuclear element. That I think he wants to 
darken the shadow a little bit is, is my is my sense and and similarly with the uh, some of the discussion of the non-nuclear strike capabilities they they kind of give these sort of menacing hints and I think that that's not uh, not accidental um, you know especially in a system that's obviously is controlled um, in its in its in its uh, release of information I think you have to assume it has some some degree of of, uh, of, of substance uh, when, when you interpret it. Um, Paul, I uh, love the bass pedal note uh, of international relations. Oh, That's fine. great. Okay, well, you have the other good one, which I'm, I'm forgetting right now. But um, you know, I think you're. I think you're right. And I mean, I, I you know, I, my my view, and I, as you know, I've been arguing for a few years. I, I think that ultimately we will have to get off this abolitionist uh, agenda and this focus on disarmament and this focus on. Uh, reductions for their own sake, certainly reductions of numbers and, and the salience of nuclear weapons, and rather have a sort of pursue something more like stability or equilibrium as a, as a strategic principle, and say, well, nuclear weapons are, are an abiding part of the international environment, and they can play a constructive role, and we will seek to control them. Uh, and by controlling them, that obviously is the kind of things that, Mark, that you're doing in terms of the proliferation, but also in terms of the regulation of their strategic effect, and, and, and that's some of the things I was talking about, like the arms control measures with 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 the Russians um, you know at some point that's that that's going to have to that's going to involve a change in the rhetoric with the non-aligned countries and in the NPT review conference context but at some point the reality is going to be so far from the uh, from the rhetoric that it's going to be it's going to be simply um, incredible and I think that that's a recipe for for uh, for not well. It's not it's not a good uh, not a good way of, of doing of doing business. I mean, there was an article in the press in the states, you know, that was sort of surprised. Oh, this president, you know, uh, David Sanger, the the president is 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 uh, funding this huge recapitalization of the U.S. nuclear weapons complex. And well, yeah, he is. And this is the guy who gave the Prague speech. Well, you know, technically, and I had this debate with with Sam Sheriff the, a month or two ago. You know, technically, you can you can reconcile this as like a medieval scholar, but it's sort of it's it's you know to the intuitive eye, you know, to the to the normal eye, it looks pretty discordant. And I think that that's ultimately you know we should just move away from it. And we should also it's it's dangerous strategically, and we're we're going to be forced to do that. You know, when we talk about what the consequence of North Korean acquisition of nuclear weapons, you know, both for the the direct military consequences, but also for the coercive and blackmail aspects, the the, the proliferation potential. Um, we need to be conscious of this, and and if our rhetoric doesn't match it, um, then I think then I think that's a problem. And I think we can we can have a rhetoric that encompasses these issues and illuminates these issues that is also seen to be responsible steward. And that's how I think that the U.S. and the Western countries should be seen it with respect to nuclear weapons. That we are responsible stewards. That we are promoters of, of global stability and security, or you know some degree of the globe. Um, in terms of INF. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, there's definitely evidence that the Russians were interested in withdrawing from INF because of China and other countries to the south. In Gates' memoir, actually, he talks a little bit about this um, in his conversation with, I think, Ivanov um, in 2007 or eight. I don't know if I have that right. But, um, you know, and the program obviously dates back far enough. And I think we can assume that it predates the, the Ukraine crisis. Um, so you know, maybe my answer to you is a, is a little bit well. Why would you need to choose? Maybe they maybe they've seen that there's enough enough strategic rationale on both parts, and they can figure it out later. It's like the issue of, of nuclear versus conventional. Well, maybe they could do both. Um, <clears throat> and you know, beyond deployment, um, what would be the indicators uh, of of where they're oriented? I mean, I think deployment would obviously be the most perhaps exercises. I mean, it seems to me that. <coughs> The types of the types of you, the types of military mission that you would need in, in an Eastern context would be quite different. Um, uh, you know, since since I think in the West the most plausible contingency is some kind of a a brouhaha starting either deliberately or not, and then an es a sort of a controlled escalation that would be a sort of ambiguous conflict. Whereas in in the East. You could have something like this, but I would imagine it would be a more strictly military contingency, as, as implausible as it might as it might seem. Um, but uh, but anyway, it's certainly something that there's there's a great degree of, inter of interest in. A question in the back row. <coughs> uh, Justin Biden, I'm a member here at the Black Hole um, You talked about escalation management, mm -hmm. and I think that's um, a really interesting uh, problem, and in a way, it's an escalation trap. And, and some of that I think goes back to what you were talking about. 
the rhetoric on both sides and you know how strongly you know, Russians are prepared to be and how weak seeming the West and NATO um, appears to be and, and I think we talked about um, you know the need to sort of bolster both convention on nuclear forces to sort of demonstrate strength mm. um, in the at least in the mind of, of the West and of, and of NATO. Um, uh, but that doesn't seem to me to be to you know to solve the problem. Mm. The problem, when you refer to it, is little green men. It's right. hybrid warfare. It's you know non-linear, you know, politico-military action. None of which is actually susceptible to uh, these sort of old-fashioned ways of arms control. Um, and I just sort of wonder whether you've given any thought to whether there are the sort of expansion of arms control that can take you into domains which aren't just the sort of five restricted, treaty-limited um, equipments you know, identified back in the 1990s to something that's new and different in the way, not necessarily warfare, but, but aggression is being conducted now. Uh, because it seems to me that you know, otherwise you're left with a gap at the bottom, the bottom end of this politico-military um, um, uh, activity, which at the moment, um, apart from as you said, I think policing, you know, the, or better policing, it doesn't, we don't seem to have an answer. To it. Yeah, I mean, I think. Well, uh, thank you for, for your question. I mean, I think in terms of what the the challenge that the little green men pose, it seems to me is the. Is the, is the implicit threat of escalation. I mean, if the Ukrainian situation were solely the little green men, the Ukrainians would have, would have dealt with it. The problem with the Ukrainian situation to me is the little green men backed by 100,000 men over the border that if the Ukrainians trigger will result in pro, you know, potentially in the loss of eastern Ukraine and the humiliation of the Ukrainian government. So in theory, if you had a riposte or, or you could block the Russian escalation, then you could deal with the little green men however you want it. I mean, it's, I think that the issue of subversion, I mean, subversion is its own, is its own problem and, is, and can be a very severe one, but I think it's, it's subversion, ver, you know, married to the, the possibility of, of, you know, effective escalation that is the real problem. And that's why I focus, partially also because I think there has been a, a real lack of uh, and forgive me if any of you take offense to this, but but a, a, of strategic <coughs> thinking of this type in, in in Europe in the last 25 years. I mean, for good reason, right? There hasn't been a sense of threat, which is nice. Um, but I think there's been a, more thinking about, and there's you know, Breedlove is talking about little green men, and lots of people are talking about little green men. But but to me, there's sort of missing, not missing the point, but under under es- emphasizing the real issue, which is the shadow that's being cast, and that that's that's particularly where the Americans and and the the Western the powerful Western militaries uh, uh, need to play. So I, d- I guess I would say I think that what I'm talking about is is important, even as the as the little green men issue are important. I mean, in terms of an arms control, I'm I'm very skeptical. I mean, to me, arms control is hard enough a- at the strategic level, and I think it's most susceptible. I mean, to me, the kind of appeal of arms control is, you know, he and I don't like each other. We recognize that we might come to blows, but we both can perceive a mutual interest in avoiding a certain kind. Of you know spiral or a certain kind of fight, um, but that has a te- that means that you focus on the technical system, which is of course you know part of the problem of arms control. It doesn't resolve the political issues. I think the little green men are classic political deliberate manipulation. So in a sense, I mean, as with conventional arms control, in some sense, it it becomes possible when it's no longer so needed. And of course, that's the charge of arms control in general. But I do think that arms control. Is possible, you know, open skies was, and the limited test ban treaties, for instance, were, were concluded at the depths of the Cold War. Technical issues, relatively straightforward. They didn't involve a political commitment at all. So I think I, I would not have a lot of, of confidence or hope for arms control uh, in the Little Green Men context. Jonathan? Uh, yeah, Jonathan Marks, BBC. I, the fascinating talk, we'll just take, roll you back a step. Mm. I mean, uh, I thought one of the most interesting uh, points you made was the. Uh, disparity between our defense capabilities on the one hand, and I think what you described as our, uh, our political ambitions mm. on the other. And I just wonder, I mean, this isn't to you know, justify the Russians going around mm. and being nasty to the, the Georgians and the Ukrainians, but I mean, isn't there a fundamental problem here that the, the arms control part of the peace, the uh, escalatory ladder part of the peace, refers to NATO territory, which mm. is covered by the NATO treaty? 
Um, it is precisely because our political ambitions got so out of kilter with our means that we extended those ambitions to places like Georgia and Ukraine. I'm not saying you know, we led them up the garden path and are responsible for the situation, mm. but there is an element of that. Uh, and I think that then further complicates the problem because I mean I was very struck by this covering the NATO summit mm. uh, in, in, in journalistic terms you know going back and talking about these sorts of you know reinforcing Eastern Europe and uh, escalatory ladders and all of this it is a vocabulary that has disappeared largely yeah. from the public mm. realm mm. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure particularly in Europe mm. where actually the EU has been one of the most egregious uh, elements in this political mm. over ambition mm -hmm. if you like. I'm really not sure how you dial back mm. uh, or, or, or re-inform the debate uh, along these sorts of lines. I mean, mm. These are concepts that people in Western Europe, I fear, are no longer interested in and think of past yeah. Passed by, you know, into a, a, a remembered past. And, you know, the, the fundamental difference between the INF the problems, the intermediate forces problems back in the day, is mm. that it was European territory, Western right. European NATO territory that right. was under threat. Right. Now it's Ukraine and Georgia, and for all the, the the shouting of the Baltics and the Poland, Poland, and so on, I'm not entirely sure that there is a credible Russian threat to the Poland and the Baltics simply because they are members of NATO. And it's interesting that what everything NATO is doing is is essentially to try and bolster the credibility of the Article Five threat has very little to do with Ukraine uh, or, or, or Georgia. Hmm. Well, uh, no, excellent, excellent point. I, uh, I mean, I, a couple of couple of sort of reactions. Um, when the when the Crimea thing happened, I my I wrote a little thing, but it was just that sort of strategy had returned to Europe. I mean, in some sense, a friend of mine refers to European policy discussions in Washington, and I imagine they're not dissimilar here. As as um, when you talked about sort of strategic considerations, it was don't disturb my Kantian guardian. You know that it was it was a kind of. I mean, there was an attempt to domesticate, and this is, you know, in some sense, this is the, the European project, which is, which has been very successful and, and, and is to be lauded in, 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 in most respects, if not if not all. Um, but I think there has, I agree with you, there has been a tendency to wish away uh, uh, or to hope to will away um, uh, these sort of strategic concerns of power, of capability, of you know, different fundamental interests that may proceed from. You know, ethnic or, or historical traditions or whatever it might be, um, and you know, what, some of the fervency of the reaction has been—it's it, sort of—it's striking to me, um, uh, you know, that there's an almost in a sense of aggrievement, like a personal aggrievement in some of the in some of the tone, um, which you know, again, is 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 not without justification. But for instance, I was struck by the by President Obama's statement at the General Assembly where he lit into the Russians for about five or six paragraphs for territorial, you know, assertiveness and aggression, uh, and did not mention China, uh, which, you know, obviously is a disputed point, but, you know, if you ask Asians, you know, it's building islands in the South China Sea and, you know, uh, oil rigs and so forth. So, so what is it that's so, you know, and I think there's obviously a context and a set of expectations. Um, you know, to my mind, I would. We are where we are, and in, in many respects, that's well. In, in almost all respects, that's a very good thing in the sense that we, you know, that we have expanded the sort of the the, the arena of peaceful kind of market free systems. Um, I would be inclined to consolidate what we have, uh, um, you know, including the Baltics and, and Poland. And I, you know, I, I, I take what you're saying, but I'm perhaps a slightly less sanguine about the possibility of a contingency in the Baltic, especially over the next few years. I would rather be on the safe side and have the Baltic guarantee not be seen as at all questionable, um, and and you know that would mean beefing up the the defensive and deterrent capabilities, whether in the Baltics themselves, obviously that has political implications, or in theater and so forth. Um, but I think you know one of the things that we, you know, somebody like me, you know, one of the reasons I think it's worthwhile getting up in the morning and going to work is. Is you know I would hope to be be somebody who might change you know shift the debate a little bit or the discussion so that it, that it incorporates these factors and you know and says well you know okay well what we, this is what we would like or some of us would like uh, what are the implications of this what is the sort of dollar figure what is the cost and risk you know implication you know militarily and so forth and I feel that that Europe and America 
on issues of, of Eastern Europe have, have left its moorings a little bit. And, you know, it's, it's one of the interesting things I've seen, again, and, and this returns to an earlier point, but a lot of the people who've been involved in these issues, it, it is very, um, yeah, it's sort of a-strategic. It's something, it's something that's seen as, as uh, almost a little emotional, you know, uh, and it, 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 you know, one of the interesting things about working in a functional expert, you know, expertise, so to speak, um, is that I go in and deal in different different regions. And if you look at the, if you if you participate in discussions about Asia, it's very different than discussions about Eastern Europe, which is very different than discussions about the Middle East. And they have their sort of anthropological realities. Um, and I think one of the things that's unbalanced in the European discussion is this lack of interest and, and respect for for these strategic realities. So. Um, hopefully that responds to your point. No, Bridget, I'm conscious you've got a plate yeah. to go and catch, but there is a, a oh, question. One more? We'll yeah. squeeze one more. Yeah. Points of detail. And I think you come on to them probably indirectly. So that you don't see any prospect of revitalizing the uh, anti-missile defense systems in Czech Republic and Poland, which were. And secondly, CFE. I mean, the Balkan and the Baltics look very exposed to me as a lady. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I just, I'm asking the question for the obvious reason mm -hmm. that Putin seems to be pushing the envelope. Yeah. Unless and until someone does something, um, he's going to continue pushing it. it. Might be in Ukraine, might be in Bulgaria, might be in Baltics. So yeah. Do you see any prospect? Of well, I think the, the the missile defense system is is continuing, and phase two kicks in. I think next year. I think we've withdrawn it as part of a reset. Well, so uh, well, it, it's 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 complexion changed. Basically, they they changed the type of missile. Um, so they did they shifted from one where they were going to put in these kind of larger missiles, ground-based interceptors that were designed for ICBMs, and they changed it with what what's called the phased adaptive approach, which is. Uh, a system that has that defends against shorter range missiles and leads up, although now they canceled phase four, it leads up, I think, to intermediate range systems by around 2018 or so. So it, it wasn't canceled, it was sort of changed. I mean, there was political debate, and some people said it had effectively been canceled. I mean, you know. But well, it was the positioning in Poland and the Czech. Right, so the Czech, I think the Czech installation is now completely gone. The Polish installation is, it will still, those, mm -hmm. there will still be a Polish installation. So, um, but so that that's still. But it could That's be that they revitalize the Czech channel. Yeah, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. But I mean, again, you know, as I said earlier to, to this gentleman, I mean, it, it is supposed to be for the Iranians, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I it's suppose you could change it, but I mean, I, th you know, I think it ha it has been designed for the Iranians. So I don't, you know, it would ha it would involve quite a radical change. Um, on your second question, CFE. Uh, CFE. I mean, I think CFE is pretty pretty dead. I think it's been de even before, even while the re reset was going on, it, it seemed it seemed pretty 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 out of it. I mean, I think you make a good point that in some sense, if you look at it, Putin does have certain opportunities um, and does enjoy a certain advantage in, 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 in certain scenarios and ways. And that's one of the reasons I think we should we should concentrate on these things to avoid giving him the impression that he would be able to move forward. But on the other hand, he does face constraints that are beyond the purely military, obviously the economic realities, the sanctions and so forth, the court of political opinion, which about which he doesn't... Positioning in a U.S. brigade in the Bal uh, Baltics. Well, I mean, there are a couple of issues. There's, there's, yeah, there the politically, there's the, the founding fine. act of uh, which was the kind of U.S. Uh, or NATO uh, Russia agreement in the late '90s, which we agreed to sort of restrain our presence in uh, well, Western NATO's presence in Eastern Europe, which may be going out, may be coming a dead letter if, if the Russians continue in the direction they're going. The other issue is that the Americans are shrinking the size of the army mm -hmm. and need to focus on other kinds of, I mean, we've got the Middle East going on, we have serious challenges to our military posture in the Pacific, so we don't have like, a lot of soldiers to throw around. So right now what you have with these ro rotational deployments, you know, I would I would think about other kinds of capabilities like pre-positioning of equipment, um, maybe a beefed up permanent presence, but also thinking about um, uh, more advanced systems in the area, uh, more defensive systems. So I think there are, and that's one of the things I'm interested in looking at uh, from here. What's the name of the Act? The NATO Founding Act. Bridge, thank you very much thank for you. a very rich and fascinating discussion. I really don't want to be responsible for you missing <laughs> your play. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you.